You know what happens? Do you know what happens? Do you know what happens when I hit the button? It goes live. People. People, people are on the other side of that camera. Hello, people. people. The people are coming. The people are coming. <laughs> Glad you're here. Thanks for being here. I am uh, very happy that it is Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Some other time possibly where you live. That's pretty cool, too. And, uh, yeah, in celebration of leading up to Christmas, I am busting out all of the old, ugly Christmas sweaters. And so this was the first one that I found in the closet. Nice. And that's what I'm rolling with today. Very it's nice. really hot in here, you know, I with know. the lights going and the <laughs> computers running and all the, the equipment doing its thing. I would never be able to do that. That was here. the first thing she said. You're, like, like, you're going to wear a sweater <gasps> Bold move. in the studio? I'm Bold like, move. yes, I am. So in about 20 minutes, if you see me, and I'm just like dripping sweat. <laughs> it's because it's hot in here. But I had to do it. I had to do it for the love of Christmas, ugly Christmas sweaters. And don't worry, <laughs> they will get uglier as the month progresses. That's my promise and my commitment to you is I will look uglier with each passing week. By the end of it all, you're going to be like, I, I can't watch this. I'm just going to have to listen. That right? thing is hideous. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, that is, uh, that's the story there. So, things today, Die Hard season. I like it, Tyler. <laughs> that's darn right. Yeah. It's Die Hard pretty season. Pretty much. I've already watched that movie about six times. So, there's that. Uh, yeah. So, today we're going to be answering your fish keeping questions. I hope you brought some. Hope well, you bring can. It. Uh, bring us some really cool stuff. Things that have been going on lately in the land of videos on Sunday, 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 Primetime Aquatics, the video I did. Oh, we had a little bit of an ammonia spike and I'll share a little bit more of that later on here in a few minutes. Uh, the, the, the problem has been resolved very quickly. So yeah, we talked about how we, uh, we got rid of those ammonia spikes and there were quite a few of them, which I fully expected, but Figured if, well, if this is going to happen, I might as well take you along for the ride and see how, see how it did. Uh, by the way, I have a question for you because that video was a little bit different. It was more of just kind of like a, I wouldn't say vlog because it wasn't a vlog, but it was, it was definitely not the, the standard standing in front of a camera sort of video with a bunch of B-roll. And I'm just curious if that's something you like or you, you like a mix or you want both or you like the more edited stuff better. Love to hear from you because you're the ones watching it. Uh, your video today yeah can you tell us a story about that heck yeah on um, the small scape some of my favorite uh schooling fish to add to a 10 gallon oh that's right schooling fish to yeah. a, a 10 gallon tank you are really on a 10 gallon theme aren't well, you well i, I even we both are. It's, it actually concluded today we concluded my 10 gallon kick are, are you going to move beyond the 10 gallon or are you, what, what, mm -hmm. what's going on here well, i'm going to go on to different ones but it was kind of concluding a thought the next one is Fish for an 11 gallon. A lot changes. That'd be funny. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. This so odd, many more I options. found this odd looking 11 gallon tank. Doesn't these the same fish you mentioned in 10 gallon? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so, yeah, there was that. And let's see here. Uh, tomorrow, yeah, because today's Wednesday. Tomorrow, we're going to be back down in the fish room for the members video. Sunday, we will be doing another, not we, not you and I, but I've got another cool video in store for you. So that's kind of the schedule for the week. Uh, and then let's see here where we're going to be. This Sunday, we're going to be at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, gcca.org. I believe it is .org or .net. .net, I think. Uh, we're going to be at the swap. And that is in Northbrook, Illinois. Website has been updated. And... We've got all the cool fish we're going to bring. Thank you to everybody who's already ordered a bunch of fish because some of the stuff we're already sold out on. Cool. I am I'm super stoked yeah, about the fish. Sweet fish. Yeah, uh, really, really excited about some of the fish that we have for sale recently at this swap. And hopefully there'll be some left at the Greenwater Swap on the 10th, which is the next place we're going to be on Saturday, December 10th. We'll be back at the Zion Lutheran Church. Their swap. Wow, already. Uh, the Greenwater Swap is there. That's yeah. crazy. Uh, I like that place. Saturday the 10th. Yeah, it's going to be cool. So, yeah, I mean, we've got some really cool stuff. The, the Empire Gudgeons, I think, are the fish that I have been wanting both to have, to keep, and also to bring in. And these fish are amazing because they came in really big. So they're like two and a half inches. They only get to about four inches or so. And they're already two and a half inches. And 
within 24 hours, I, I put some of them in a 10 gallon with dark substrate and some, some of them in a 10 gallon with lighter substrate and it didn't matter. They both, the, the fish in both of those tanks, they, they're already, they're getting the beautiful red fins. If you haven't seen them, look them up, Empire Gudgeons. Uh, they are amazing and they're not easy to find. So I was really happy when they were, they came in and they're so healthy and, and vibrant. Uh, the other one is the, I got these fish or a very similar fish a long time ago at a swap. And I remember coming home being so excited because I got the lizard tail pleco. Uh -huh. They were listed and labeled as L10A. Uh, the ones that we have in are lizard tail plecos L11A, but they look pretty much the same. I don't know if they changed the designation. I haven't looked into it enough, but these are a, it almost looks like a, a whip tail cat. They don't get very big, like four inches or so. They they stay relatively small. They're relatively inactive, but ours are out. The, the ones that we've had for a number of years, man, as soon as you feed, they're out and about, and they just add. They almost look like prehistoric. Imagine if you know what a sturgeon fish is. It basically looks like a very miniaturized version of a sturgeon. It's a version of a sturgeon. It's not like you know scientifically, but it kind of looks like that. But they stay small, and they're going to do all the same algae-eating stuff that plecos do for the most part. And they're really cool. I love those fish, and people are... I don't know how many we have left, but there's not that many. And then the quarry cats. Uh, we've got the uh, Dolphi quarries and the <laughs> Venezuelan quarries. Super and cool. we're adding a little color to the quarry cat collection. Uh, we, we do panda quarries a lot. Love them, but I'm like, you know what? The Adolphis, we have them in a 75-gallon. I've had them there for years with the geophagus and the rainbow fish. And they're just so cool. They've got the orange heads, the black stripe, and the Venezuelas with the, the green and the orange. Oh, really cool fish. We've got the, the Bosmani. They're big and they're active. And they're already, even at a couple inches, two and a half inches, you're starting to see the yellow and the blues come out already. So it's really exciting. It's very cool stuff. So yeah, that's the swap on Saturday. And then, like I said, I'm sorry, Sunday, Sunday the 4th, GCCA Northbrook. And then next Saturday, the Greenwater one is the 10th. So we're looking forward to that back to backs. And then there's not much going on until January, which is, I mean, it's December. So there's not much going on for a few weeks after that. So what, what do you got? You got something you want to share? You look like you have, you have things you want to share with the, with the group. Um, oh, Jeff had asked uh, earlier if he has a specific question for you. Where should he, where should he leave that for you? Right here. Yeah. All right, and, I mean, so, all right. So when it comes to questions, the best place to ask a question is in a YouTube comment section because those I check every single day. And if I can answer the question, I do. So th that is the best place by far because I get lots and lots of comments, but that just tends to be somewhere where I gravitate to where I answer a lot of those. People will send me questions via Instagram. I very, very rarely ever check like the question stuff. And plus most of those questions get caught up in like a, a, a spam filter because if they're not a follower and like all this stuff, it's just like they get caught up in this general folder. And by the time I get to those questions, like, oh, this thing's been sitting here for two months. Um, Facebook, again, even the Primetime Aquatics Facebook, it, it's hit or miss. I, I sometimes check it, mostly don't. Uh, the email is a horrible place unless, you know, the, the email associated with our website. I, I filter those so that I'm looking for questions specific to something that we're doing. Like, so if it's, it's a sale, fish sale, merch sale, business thing, that's really what that email is for. And yeah, so the, the YouTube comment section is the best. This is probably the next best place, you know, in terms of fish care, because no guarantee we're going to be able to answer the question because in an hour and a half live stream, typically for us, a thousand to 1200 comments come through. So obviously you start doing the math and some yeah. questions take more time. I don't get a chance to answer them all. So that's kind of how the question situation runs. What else you got? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, like, like you said, we try to get to as many possible questions as we can. So if we don't get to your question, nothing personal. We're just <laughs> trying to, uh, you're usually working up. I'm trying to work down and yeah. get and a variety. It skips and then it jumps and it's like, it okay, does. wow. All right. I don't know where I left off, but I can't scroll up to where I was before. <laughs> ah, the YouTube, <laughs> the YouTube situation. Uh, so yeah, those are the things that are, are basically going on in the upcoming near future. And by the way, if you do have a question, and I think somebody mentioned it already, is you, if you put the at Primetime Aquatics in front of it, that highlights it in orange for us, and then we know, okay, this is a question, and it kind of keys our eye in on that. Yeah. So. 
Uh, Tyler had a question. Can I breed Bolivian rams in a 20 gallon? What's a good dither for them? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we've bred Bolivian rams in a, in a 20 long, but a 20, a standard 20 is fine. If you've got just a pair, I, I don't know if I would put any, if you're trying to breed, don't put any more than a pair in there because the other fish will probably pick off the babies. The other thing you have to be careful of is if you truly do want to breed them and you want them to survive, the dither fish are probably not a good idea because any dither fish you add is probably going to be big enough to eat the babies unless they're really small, in which case the adult Bolivian rams might eat them. So uh, I, if you really want to breed them, leave them by themselves. And that's one of the things I tell people who are worried, just generally speaking, oh, I, I don't want fry. I don't want babies. I don't want guppies to overrun my tank or platies. I'm like, that's not going to be a problem if it's a community tank. Because if you've got anything, you know, dwarf grami, grami or larger, they're probably going to eat the fry. Most cichlids are going to eat guppy fry and platy fry and even molly fry. Uh, a lot of fish will eat each other's fry. So for the Bolivian rams, if you want to maximize survival, just, just put the pair. And it seems like a waste. Now, you could, if you wanted to, put dither fish in there. And like if you start to see fry, because they're going to try to do a good job of protecting them. The problem is if you got, let's say, two Bolivian rams and a, and a standard 20, and they've got their little pocket of fry, and they're doing a good job, and the fry are underneath the parents, they're generally not going to allow a lot of fish around. But let's just say they had 25 offspring on their first on their first go around, which is a pretty decent amount, and you've got neon tetras in there. Black neon standards, uh, maybe you put some, I don't know, phantom tetras or something, those fish are really fast. And while they're not just going to go down there and be like, pow, 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 and just pick them all off in five minutes, what they will do is they will just wait. Wait until a few of the fry get a little too far away, and they just go, pow. And they might pick one off or two off every day. And at the end of like 10, 15 days, a month, you're like, Boom. where did they all go? They're mm -hmm. gone. They were fish food. So the, the thing you can try is when you first see the fry appear, you could try to suck them up with a turkey baster and put them in like a, a, a breeder net or a breeder box and grow them that way. But it's definitely not a surefire way to do it. Jasmine wants to know, do we take extra fish to the swaps apart from the pre-order fish? Yes. Definitely. Yes, we do. If we have any left. So yeah, I always recommend if you're going to go to the swap and you know you want something, just pre-order it because then you show up to the swap and we have your fish ready. It's got your name on it. And then we just pull it out of the pre-order big giant tote or two. And then you get them and you can just like, or we just, you know, you walk around the swap like, okay, I mean, I've got a pre-order. I'm going to walk around for a while, but before I leave, I'm going to grab my fish. That's fine. Uh, the, you know, the downside to not pre-ordering is, and this is, happens every single swap every time. since we've been doing, this is why we did the pre-orders and, and had the website established for pre-orders because Every swap, someone's like, oh my gosh, I saw on the website you had this. I'm like, yeah, they were gone after five minutes because you and 25 other people saw it. And they'll make a beeline right to the table. But I'll take these three bags. I'm like, well, those are the three bags of extra that we had. They're gone. So, Or or in every, I thought you were going to say every single swap, it'll happen. Somebody will look at something like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to take a loop around. Yeah. And, like, and there's one, okay. like, you can just see those. I'm and like, then you that's can see one as soon as they put right it down and walk like, <laughs> Okay, here you go. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That sniping thing happens in real life too. It's like, all right, I'm going to just look at this for a second. And uh, now it's gone. Uh, Bernie says, how do I breed Tetras? For the most part, the Tetras are egg scatterers. And what you're going to do is Tetras tend to breed at certain times of the day. And they're going to be egg scatterers. And so you're going to want maybe some Java moss or a spawning mop that's going to catch those eggs. You remove the Java moss or easier to re just remove a spawning mop. And keep in mind, I don't breed Tetris because I don't want to go through the hassle of feeding very, 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 very tiny fry. For me, I generally don't breed anything that isn't going to be able to survive on live baby brine shrimp from the time that I spawn them. So that limits me. So when it comes to like tetras and barbs and stuff, I don't I don't bother with that rasboras. I don't bother breeding them. So if I were going to do that, I would set up a spawning mop and then pretty much every day they're gonna they're gonna lay eggs and you throw that spawning mop in another 10 gallon that's got a cycled sponge filter. Usually within a day or so the eggs hatch. They're gonna be extraordinarily tiny fry. Uh, they're going to have to go through their egg sacs, which is probably going to take about a day or, or maybe two. I don't remember exactly because, like I said, I don't really breed them. And then uh, feed them infusoria and then maybe some live baby brine after a couple months. So if you really want to know a good way to breed, because this is one of the videos I did was 
a video on tiger barbs. And the other one I did, and it was the same person, it was actually the same clip, that was Dane's Fish Room. So I went to uh, Dane's Fish Room in Florida. He was, he was a, he had a fish room when I was down there speaking at the uh, Pasco County Fish Club. And he did a little segment on how he breeds tiger barbs. But the way he breeds tiger barbs is also a way that you could breed a lot of the tetras that you're interested in. So check out that video, either Dane's Fish Room Tour or the tiger barb video I did. And towards the end, I actually go back to that clip and I let him talk about how he breeds them since I'm just not doing that. So, yeah. What you got? <laughs> Oink, uh, Oink Master says, uh, happy almost anniversary to you both. Oh, that's... Oh! You forgot. You were going to forget too. No, I've got something. I've got something waiting. It's so tomorrow. I. I, I was just kidding. It's tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It's tomorrow. I've been waiting for it for months. Yeah. Um, so anyways, she said, sorry, I'm, I'm running a few minutes late. My handle broke on a bucket with two gallons of water in it and spilled out all oh, over. No. That's I am not so cool. Sorry. That, so for anybody who's ever worried about, oh my gosh, if my tank breaks, it would be bad. I want, you to, I want you to just mentally picture this because a lot of us, a lot of people haven't experienced a significant amount of water on the floor. And until you do, <laughs> you don't really realize how much a volume on a floor, like how much that actually is. Yep. So <laughs> if you ever want to just think about it, and I wouldn't do this with hardwood floors or carpet, take a glass of water and just chuck it on your kitchen floor. <laughs> Be like, wow, that wow. was a lot. That was eight ounces. Imagine a gallon. If you fill up a gallon jug and you just went blah, 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 all over the floor until it was empty, that takes a long time to clean up. This is why, except for these tanks right here now and one in the bedroom, we have no tanks upstairs. And we actually, we said we weren't going to put any tanks upstairs. Yeah. You've since broken down one, two, three, four upstairs. But I've had tanks that have had... Usually it's a hang on back filter that gets all jacked up yeah. and starts dumping water on the floor. And we I come down there in the morning. Uh, so for the, the biggest amount of water I've ever had on the floor was the 40 gallon breeder. That's where the bristlenose plecos are, are breeding right now, or in theory breeding. Uh, the hang on back filter got messed up. It started spewing water out of the back and out of the 40 gallon breeder, I was probably missing about this much water. Now, luckily it's in the basement. The basement is tile. The right around, you wouldn't be able to see this, but around the perimeter, for the most part, there is no um, molding, there's no trim. That is by design. So the, the wall goes all the way down to the ground, but it, it stops about this far away. Now, here's another interesting thing. When I did that with the basement, I, I basically, oh my gosh, I remember doing this when I did it. And it basically destroyed my shoulders and my whole upper body, but I took a, a, a hammer drill and I drilled the studs right into the cement, but I stopped them also about this far from the bottom of the, the ground, the floor. And the purpose of that is when the water starts to drip or leak like this did, it hits the, the tile, goes to the point where the lowest part of the basement is, which is the floor drain, and basically wraps around the two back walls right into the drain. But even with that, that was about 10 gallons. And there was a significant amount of water that had not yet been drained. So yeah, I recommend, especially if you've got anything larger, well, even if you've got a 10 gallon or larger, there's a wonderful tool that we have employed many times in our basement. It's called the wet dry vac. This is a lifesaver, and I'm not kidding. If, if a tank ever goes and you've got a significant amount of water on the floor, trust me, towels are not gonna help you. So you're going to need some way to remove the water before you know, it sinks into the carpet or starts soaking through if you've got it on an upstairs floor and it starts going downstairs. The wet dry vac is an amazing tool because you wet dry vac all that up and then you can take your towels and you can clean it all up. And then if you've got carpet or something that got wet, now you've got fans running. And that's, that's the best way that I know, at least in our fish room, mm-hmm. not to deal with disaster. Mm. Hmm. We've got... Uh, hmm. We we've we've got a lot of a lot of folks here. We've got James Nature Aquatics. So so, and uh, he says that Rebecca, that's his wife, says hi and happy anniversary. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Loved your video today, by the way. He did a um the uh at, what's what's the name Atlantis, the launch. Yeah. 
he had a video of it. It was really cool. It was nice. really cool. Really extra bonus there. I like it. And then uh, uh, Grant's here, and cool. so is uh, Secret Life. Nice. Very cool. Glad you yeah. are here. And then, of course, we've got our awesome mods. We've got Oink and we've got Dave. Yeah. Very Yay. nice. Thank you for being here. Sergey says, wet, dry vacuum <laughs> are cheap. Also, Home Depot. Yeah. They, yeah. And you don't have to have a huge one. But mm. it's just, it gets all the stuff off and you can just dump it right down the sink and then start again. So you don't have to have the massive one. We tend to have the bigger ones just because something ever goes wrong, it's probably going to go really wrong. And uh, I like to have that freedom. And that also means, just as a fish keeping safety note while we're on the subject, don't have power strips and stuff directly on the ground because inevitably what's going to happen is if that seal ever breaks on a tank and you've got a power strip that's just laying there right behind the tank on the floor, that thing gets wet and now you've gone from I've got a wet floor to if I step in this I'm going to die sort of thing. So please, electricity, keep it off the floor. Even like the power ships that we have downstairs are all drilled into the racks uh, or if there's anything, there's, there's, there's nothing directly on the floor. It's all elevated off just in case we do get water leaks. We don't have to worry about, okay, if I step in this water, am I also going to get the surprise of a lifetime? Huh. Last thing you want, you'll know if it happens because I'll come to a live stream or the next video will be like my beard will just be like, like sticking straight out cartoons like in the cartoons i mean i don't have any hair so i just have if, to be my beard but, if it was only hey, that man, easy yeah is that ever gonna go back to normal mm, uh, i don't know i'm still feeling a little woozy tingly yeah all right let's see here left four thank you for becoming a prime timer prime eight prime time partner appreciate you being here Yay. hope you enjoy it cheryl says i agree jason what dry vac carpet shampoo uh, carpet shampoo is great for the carpet too. That's a great point. So the wet dry vac is going to do a pretty decent job. And the, the uh, carpet cleaner, if you've got tanks on carpet, because then you, of course, you'd want to probably give it a little spritz of carpet soap. <laughs> I don't know why I find that. Does anybody else find that like really just rewarding? Is the vacuuming to me is not rewarding, but when you bust out the carpet cleaner and you're just like, Shh, and then you're sucking up all the the juicy stuff, and you're like. Man, this is looking good. The carpet was kind of dirty. This, this feels so much better, and it smells nice, too. But yeah. did you know that you're not supposed to clean your carpet that often? Oh, well, we don't. Do you want to know why? Mold? Well, yeah, because basically it's it's really hard to completely dry them, so yeah. it actually sometimes causes them to be dirtier than when they originally were. Hmm. Tragic. That is tragic. Jasmine says, do you guys decorate your tanks for the holidays? I don't, but... You sometimes kind of sort of do, but I've, you haven't this year so far. I've been known to, except the last couple months. No, I didn't even do my, my infamous pumpkin shrimp tank. And I had it, well, you've seen parts of it sitting, waiting, and I just have yeah. not completed it. So, And I since probably two years, I have two winterscapes that I just, that are in my head. Oh, sorry. Gosh. Excuse me, sir. Um, that like are always in my head. James, James gets it. You have to have escape in your head for a long time, and then you actually put it. It's just been in my head a long time. So I, I would, but I haven't yet. I might. There you, there's your answer. Let's all hold our breath. <gasps> <laughs> Don't do that. I'm feeling no. Woozy again. <laughs> yeah. Tom says, have you ever bred crayfish? Any tips on how to breed them? I have not ever bred crayfish, and I don't know how to do that. Oh, uh, babies would yeah. be so cute. I do know that they will rip each other apart when they get to a certain age yeah. if they're together too closely. I used to catch crayfish all the time out of the creek by our house. And those things would live forever. I mean, they, were really? the, they weren't the colorful ones. They were just the brown ones. I uh, made the mistake one time of, of having some crayfish in the Oscar tank. And I'm like, oh, yeah, they're getting along fine. I mean, I, I knew at some point I'd have to move the Oscars or move the crayfish out of the Oscar tank. And I waited a little too long. <laughs> and then one night I walked down. Remember that? And one Oscar had one half of the crayfish, and the other Oscar took the other half of the crayfish out of the other Oscar's mouth, and they both had half a crayfish. I'm like, dang it. Dang it. I waited too long. That's a bummer. I know. So Oscars and crayfish are not good tank mates. Just want you to know that. Good to know. Yep. Lucas says, it's your boy, Electro Fried Jason. <laughs> <laughs> it's your boy, Jason, here feeling a little tingly. <laughs> Stepped on the power strip. It was wet. Yeah, bad idea. No. That would not be cool. <laughs> Hold on, I saw something. Oink says, my dad's basement is in his circa late 1800s is notorious for flooding. Oh, oh I bet. Yeah. Oh, boy. Not the older cool. houses. Yeah. 
Oh, Melanie says, my canister filter, I didn't close the valve correctly. Realized when the floor warped. Luckily, it dried flat. I have a water alarm on each tank. Yeah, oh, that's, that's another good idea is, water alarm. especially if you're away a lot and you've got a lot of tanks, there are water alarms. In fact, there were some wow. companies that wanted to send me some and I just never followed up with it. But it's not a bad idea. And I know like some of the people in our clubs, they have these alarms because they travel a lot. And everything is basically automated. They have automated water change systems, uh, overflow, you know, the automated overflows, all that stuff, drip systems, automatic feeders, like really advanced. And they do, they have the the floor alarms everywhere. And then they have what's kind of cool. I gotta get back to these fish rooms and show you the, the new things they've added. They have cameras all over their fish rooms so that if there is a problem, they can look at the cameras and be like, okay, what exactly is going on? And then they can talk this kind of talk somebody through the problem solving issue. It's kind of cool. Squibsy, Squibsky wants to know, are any of your fish photogenic? My goldfish Logan loves a camera shot. That's fun. I would have to say our most photogenic fish would be the Shellies. That's one reason to get Shellies because they just really hang out. You can get lots yeah. of cool pictures. If beautiful blue eyes, that would be my pick. Well, the Severum too. I that's, think Severums are fairly that's photogenic. True. I once got a really um, good, didn't that magazine use a picture that I took? Yes, and then our geophagus. He's the bomb. When he's, he's pretty much a, when he knows he's being filmed, he's just like. That's true. What's up? Behold. Check it out, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are pretty good. But, the, oh, my gosh, some of them are just absolutely brutal. Try to photo, you know, try to make, take a photo of guppies or endlers. Chili they're, rasboras, yeah, mirror rasboras. Kind of, kind of, or any, most of the barbs, there's like pow, 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 and it's like, oh, my gosh, rainbow shiners. Mm, they're good constantly luck. on the move. We have rainbow shiners too back that are going to the swaps these next two weeks. It, it's funny. Rainbow shiners are the type of fish where people will see them and they're like, eh, I don't know what that is. And they just kind of walk by. But for the people who know what they are, they're like, how many bags you got? I need them all. Because <laughs> rainbow shiners yeah. are one of those fish where they might not look like much in a bag or when they're young. And then when you get them home happy and healthy, whew, the colors. Whoo, whoo. <laughs> Pretty cool. Oh, and John Wood had asked, John, I don't know if you're still here. You had asked, uh, you saw my video and you ran out and got uh, chili rasboras. Rock on. You won't nice. be sorry. How many do you, he wanted to know how many to put in a five gallon? How many would you put in a five gallon? Six to eight easily. That's what I would put. Yeah. yeah. Maybe slightly nice more. I think you, we had the dwarf rasbora, which is slightly bigger than a chili. And in that five gallon downstairs, I think we had 10 or 12. And it, it didn't mm -hmm. look over a stock. They weren't no. cramped like, I don't know what to do. And with the 10 gallon, that was the Fluval spec. We somewhat minimized, not minimized the flow, but we restricted the flow just a little bit. But they were all like, yeah, let's get in that flow. It's going to be awesome. Like all yeah. 12 of them were just 10 or 12. I don't remember they were just surfers. Head. They were just like, let's just sit wonder in here and pretend like we're going somewhere. I wonder if chili rasbors are the same. That would be fun. Do you, ever, do you, you think know. their eyes ever got irritated with all the water blowing into them? I don't know how do they do fish, this. Yeah, you know? fish are like, oh, man, there's too much water flowing in my eyes. Kind of like when it's windy outside. They're like, I wish I had my water glasses. Oh, uh, that'd be so cute. Little tiny goggles. Uh, they just chuck them on their eyes. <gasps> this is better. Now uh, we can go back in the flow. I can see again. They're all squinting. Ricky, Ricky, like I do. Ricky brought up a really great point. What's that? And he's been a member for 21 months. Wow, yeah, nice. Thank you. Um... I think green neons are the most photogenic. Oh, I bet they are. Don't you know, tell her that. I, yeah. Yours are pretty As, good though. They, they tend to stay good. fairly stationary. They kind of kind of creep around in the in the weeds. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're creep around in the weeds, fish. That's right. Well, they're not gonna be creeping around in those weeds much longer because that's the last tank that you have to get those fish out of, so I can complete my quarantine nook. <laughs> yeah. I have a quarantine nook now formerly known as your nano nook yeah now you've taken over part of my fish wall that's right so uh, great I'm, deal scott says i have a 400 gallon that's seven feet by 40 oh. inches by 30 inches tall well i gotta process that for a second so seven feet long that's, that's pretty crazy cool. yeah. so seven feet so that's what that's like what 84 inches uh by 40 inches wide that's pretty cool 30 inches tall so that's actually really nice that's about the same height as our 150 so that's, that's a nice tank uh, what should I add besides the four Florida gar and a lungfish uh, looking for something mid to top level? Man, I don't know because you got some predators in there, some predatory fish. Um, I, I don't know. I don't keep monster fish. So I've never had gar, never had a lungfish. Lungfish, 
I wonder how that's going to work. Just thinking out loud, because all the lungfish I've ever seen are full grown, basically don't move a whole lot. And the Florida, well, not that Florida gar are crazy active, but how do you keep, I guess it's more a question for you, Scott. I mean, do, how, how does the lungfish get enough food with the gar in there? Like, do you have to spot feed the lungfish? I mean, and, and I don't know, I, again, you're, you're I will fully admit when it comes to monster fish, you're looking at a pure rookie. I have no experience with those fish. The biggest fish I've ever kept was our tilapia. It was 18 and a half inches, and it wasn't like I was set out to be like, I'm going to keep monster fish. The next biggest fish was an Oscar. So, I mean, fish like Oscars are, are not terribly aggressive, but I don't know if they would just so outcompete the other fish for food that they'd be like, okay, all these other things are starving. I really have no idea. I'm just curious how the Florida gars and the lungfish, how they do for uh, food competition. I'd like to know that, if you don't mind. Let's see here. Vip says, can you keep a male betta in a tank with a canister filter, Fluval 307? I have a 40-gallon, want to make a community tank, but I am afraid that even with the adjusted flow, the canister will be too powerful. I don't have that filter the Fluval 307 but most of the the returns on canister filters are fairly strong 40 is a decent sized tank so it just depends on where the flow is obviously the bed is going to would prefer to be near the top of the tank so if you're getting this whirlpool type thing or you're getting a strong flow where it's like the bed gets in there and just blows right away it's probably not going to last too long because it's going to get tired it's going to be afraid to go to the top and then it's going to just spend most of its time sitting at the bottom so the one thing that you can do to kind of restrict the flow is sometimes we'll take sponge from like a sponge filter, cut a hole in it, and then kind of place the sponge over the intake, but we mostly do it with tanks this size. So it's a small piece of sponge with a canister, with a Fluval 307, that piece of sponge might have to be a little bit larger, and you might have to take like a twisty tie or something to make sure it's it's really strapped onto the, the return. But it'd have to be closed at the other end, right? So you only have one opening, and then play with that. Sometimes what I'll do is if the if the flow is restricted too much, I'll take a pair of scissors and just kind of snip and cut around to make the holes a little bit larger in certain areas. But you could try that, but I don't know if it's going to work. What you got? Oh, MNC Aquatics. What's up? Do we know this? I don't know. Uh, speaking of anniversaries, my wife and I will be celebrating our 30th tomorrow. Hey, well, sweet. happy anniversary to you. Got to Ours speak. is... 21. 21. 21 tomorrow. 21 long years. We're catching up on you. That's right. <laughs> 209. What's a good food to feed growing corridors that are about an inch or slightly less but already have their covers? So that's that basically describes a lot of the quarries that we have in our fish room right now. So the Adolphi, the Venezuela quarries, when we bring in pandas, they're all about uh, three quarters to an inch or so. I feed all of them. I, I take the North Fin micro pellets. I think that that's just the cichlid pellets of the community. I just kind of switch them up and just chuck them in there. And they eat those. They, they love those. Um, they're probably at a point where if you wanted to spend time chopping up bloodworms, they'd probably eat those. Uh, frozen brine shrimp, they would eat that. But they're not, I don't find them to be very picky. You could do, uh, what else? I mean, even once in a while, I'll throw flake food in there. I know once the flake food has been in the water, some of those vitamins kind of go away, but I'll tend to throw the flake food like right by where the sponge filter is like really, you know, kicking out its water and it just sinks right away. They eat that, but you could try the micro pellets from Northfin. That stuff, all of our, that's what I feed all of our quarry cats and they devour the stuff. Jen wants to know uh, if we have a lid option recommendation for someone who has a large Garfield kitty <laughs> that can open things and may be large enough to break a flimsy tank lid. Yes. So I think your option might be the eight millimeter polycarbonate greenhouse siding. Don't get the six. The six will sag. The eight millimeter stuff is a little bit, uh, it's definitely thicker. The nice thing about that is a, it's not glass, so it's not going to crack. I don't, that cat can jump up and down on that eight millimeter stuff and it's, it's not going to crack. Uh, you still are probably going to have to weigh it down. I'm assuming that's probably what you're doing with your lid now, unless it's sitting right there in the, if it's a glass lid, it's probably sitting within the rim, which maybe you're not weighing it down. But there's two ways that you could do do the eight millimeter polycarbonate. Uh, one, go to Amazon. They usually have it there too. Where I got a lot of mine was Greenhouse Megastore Direct. I think that's what it was. 
And I did a video on like polycarbonate versus glass. You could check that. It's got a link in there somewhere um, on where to buy it. But the nice thing about the eight millimeter it, or, or any polycarbonate is you can cut holes in it. So if like, you got a cord running in your tank, you can cut a little hole. I, you can just use scissors. Um, you can cut feeding holes if you want to. You can glue little lids to it. You can cut basically, you don't have to cut the whole piece. You can basically cut two pieces and you still have kind of like a lid where you can take the front half off for maintenance and stuff. So I would try that. It's cheap. It's, it doesn't break. And depending on how you fasten, I mean, you could cut it large enough so it's resting on the lid instead of in it uh, and then weigh it down and your cat's probably going to be like, dang, this is boring. I can't get to the wet stuff now. If, of course, there isn't a, uh, the size tank that you have is not uh, uh, set to have a, um, like a, what would you call it? It's a lid that has the light included, the plastic, mm -hmm. because those are really pretty darn sturdy. Oh, yeah, those, right? yeah but those, those are mostly kit. I mean, I, I, right. yeah, but those are mostly kit lids where you, I don't even know if they sell those. So I you're talking about I the have. one piece black you yeah. have? Okay, you I go to PetSmart I... and Petco more than I do. Yeah. So I was, I was actually surprised too that I saw it. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's a really good option. I didn't even think about that. But as, that depends on what size tank you have. Yeah, they would only standard. sell those for a 10 and probably a, a 20 standard. I don't yeah. even think a 29 has those. So she's talking about the black one piece plastic lids. Now the downside to those is a... I actually hate them because it makes the tank really hard to work on because you have to take that entire lid off to get a gravel vac in there and then the light is attached to the inside of the lid so now you can't see as well if you're trying to catch fish that's usually really difficult to do but it will definitely keep your cat out for sure so yeah that's a good that's a good option yeah scott thank you so much for the super chat uh the long fish will actually hand feed oh that's cool oh well, he's he's a pig uh, <laughs> i worry about fish picking on him yeah i would too uh, that's that's yeah because the lungfish don't really do much uh, and, and the gar aren't like aggressive or anything they just they've got a, a big sort of appetite so if you're looking for fish that are more chilled out but still get big I'll tell you what the tilapia I had <clears throat> was like I said 18 and a half inches if you go back and look at the fish room tours uh, the last time that tilapia was in a video was I think it was maybe fish with the most personality um, certainly like the tours that we, the fish room tours of like 2020, he would have been in there and, and probably the part ones, which would have been like the side with the multi tank, but the tilapia are cool. They get big. So he, like I said, he was 18 and a half inches because his, his mouth and his tail, when he would turn in that 125, they touched the front and back of the tank, but they're really, really peaceful fish. Is this big? Is that what you were showing? This big? 18 that, and a half inches. Yeah. He was not that big. He his okay. he literally eighteen eight. That's that's this long. That's he was this big. He was bigger than me, man. He was huge. No. So anyway, but they're really fairly docile. So, I mean, they're not aggressive at all. I used to breed peacock cichlids in there, and as long as you kept the tilapia and the Oscar decently fed, they'd leave the fry alone. Never saw him pick on another fish or even chase another fish. Uh, and really pretty, really colorful. Some of those tilapia. Uh, Oreochromis is the genus. So if you look at Oreochromis, those could be really cool options. Really cool. But they do get big. Well, you got a 400 gallon tank, so you want to fill that bad boy anyway. But really nice personality. They have these big, crazy lips. And they <laughs> literally eat anything. Never in my life did I put something, food, in that tank. It, I mean, anything. Hamburger? And it would be like, it, well, I don't put people food in there, but any fish food. Mac and cheese? No. No, okay. that fish ate it all. <laughs> it was crazy, totally crazy. All right, so here's a question for you. Okay. This is fun. Everybody play along. Chris Sear asks, community with only iridescent fish, green neon rasbora, blue tetra, cardinal tetra, black neon tetra, glow light tetra, and laser quarries. Can you think of any other fish with those qualities? That are iridescent? Mm-hmm. I mean... So small schooling? I would say the uh, gold tetra. Did you say gold tetras? Yeah, the x-ray tetras don't get that. I mean, they get a little bit larger, but the x-ray tetras are pretty cool. They're kind of clear. They wouldn't uh, be iridescent. No, they're more clear. Yeah, they're more clear. They're cool, though. There are some. I mean, I know they're not tetras. They're not, gonna, they're not going to. Glow Daniels, Rocky and Miles, yep. Neon Dwarf Rainbow, thank you, Melanie. That's perfect. That's a great suggestion, the Neon Dwarf Rainbow. Um, some of the guppies have iridescence and endlers. I know that's not a tetra, but 
that has iridescence. What else? Neon barbs, says Ray. Yeah, those are good. But the dwarf neon rainbow, yeah, that's that's a really good suggestion. And they're cool, and they're relatively chilled out. Would you call rice fish iridescent? Uh, silvery iridescent, yeah. The Madaka rice fish, that's a good one. But it's not, a, again, that's not a tetra thing. But no. they're very peaceful, very interesting fish, for sure. T saying, what inverts can I keep with Imbuna? I have a 75 gallon. Here's your list. Nothing. <laughs> no. uh, in Buna, they they just love to eat snails. They'll eat shrimp. They'll eat crayfish. They'll they will basically. I can't think of an invertebrate that they wouldn't eat. Yeah, I, I I really that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. I don't think. But I'm just going off the top of my brain. Unless somebody else can think of something like yeah, I had in Buna and these were fine, but they will pretty much like to eat just about all the invertebrates I can ever possibly imagine you would find in a common and the thing is our African cichlid tanks have no snails zero snails no Malaysian trumpet snails no ponds and we do not make any effort to not have snails spread from tank to tank I've given up at this point if there are snails in there they're in there yeah, and if they're going to spread they're going to spread and there isn't a single snail in that Mbuna tank there's no snails in the peacock tanks they love them all forms of Invertebrates. What you got? You just look like you have something to say. Again, I lost it. Okay, Brandon says, I just got two pair of bristlenose plecos, one pair of super reds, sweet, and one pair of albino, also cool. Any quick suggestions on breeding parameters and fry foods? Yes, I've bred, I don't even know, maybe thousands of bristlenose at this point. The... I did a video on how to save money buying caves. So you can buy those Pleco caves that people make and they're, they're good, but they're way more expensive than if you just go on Amazon. And especially for the bristlenose, you get the terracotta watering stakes. Again, I did a video, just type in caves, primetime aquatics. It'll take you that video, it's like three minutes long. So the terracotta watering stakes, the reason why I like those. So what they're designed to do is go in like a potted like you know like you got a potted plant they stick in there or even in the ground outside they stick in there and then people can take a wine bottle filled with water turn it upside down it will slowly release water into the soil while you're gone that's what they're supposed to do however they're way better at breeding plecos because they're tapered on one end what happens when plecos breed is the f the female goes in the cave and the male kind of blocks her in they breed the female releases the eggs the male lets her go so the first thing I like about those caves is they, it really allows the male to trap the female in the cave, which is part of the breeding process. And then when the female leaves, it also allows the male to really get in there and block the, the eggs, but more importantly, block the fry before they're ready to leave because the male will keep the fry in the cave until they're ready to be released. And they're really tiny when they're released. So th that's thing number one. Thing number two is I have not found them to be picky at all when it comes to water parameters. Our water has a pH between 8 and 8.2, general and carbonate hardness of 10 degrees a piece. That's definitely not ideal. That is certainly on the upper end. And we keep our tanks at around 78. Some areas of the fishery might even be 80 degrees. So that's our water parameters. If I were doing this in an ideal situation, that pH would be closer to neutral, so pH is 7. And the water hardness might be a little bit less. Temperatures would be about the same. So they're really not that picky. After the fry are released from the cave, the best food that I have fed fry is rapashi. And they have a different types. Uh, the Community Plus, I find, is a really good food. They have one that's called Morning Wood. That's just what they named it. It's a green one. Uh, I'll usually put that in and just make a little tray of it and then cut it out into small blocks. You know, Thinner blocks are better than thicker blocks. And you'll just see a whole... In fact, the, the bristlenose pleco video that I did, some of those shots, you can see a bunch of baby bristlenose just chowing down on a big block of rapashi food. That to me is the best. I would also, if possible, try to breed them on sand and not gravel. That was a mistake that I had made. Uh, one of the bristlenose tanks that we have is on gravel. And so when you feed them all that sinking food, like the rapashi, or eat, I mean, they'll eat just standard. They're not picky. So you can chuck in, like what we will feed uh, the North Fin 
uh, cichlid pellets, but they're usually the two millimeter size or three millimeter. But when you do that on gravel, some of that stuff just kind of sinks in there, especially they're patchy, and you've got to constantly gravel back that, and then you're worried about sucking up fry. So if you do it on sand, it tends not to sink in there, and the fish have more access to it. But yeah, that, it's a lot of fun watching those little, remember little tiny babies? They're just like this big, and they're just kind of staring like, what is that stuck to the glass? Like, oh my gosh, it's baby bristle baby, nose. So uh, other thing cute. is... I primarily use sponge filters when I'm breeding bristle moles because they're small enough where some filters with the intakes or put a filter, an intake sponge over the intake uh, because they can get sucked up by the intake. They're pretty small. Mm. Um, the, uh, are we done with that uh, I'm done with thought? that spiel and that thought. Sweet. Also, the lamp by Rasbora, we always forget to mention oh that. Gosh. That's That would yeah. be iridescent. Thank you Those are that. really yes, pretty. Those, are, those should be at like close to the top of the list. And dwarf grammy. So super iridescent. You think the dwarf gravy is iridescent? Yeah. Well, I'd say it's more of like a blue or a red or a... Maybe. Maybe. maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, yeah, maybe the powder blues. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're like makeup color. But, oh, my gosh. The lamp by <laughs> Rasbora, whoever said that. Me. I just thought of it because we always forget about that one. Somebody quick, put it in the chat so we <laughs> don't give her the credit for it. Totally we fine. We can't have, her have a swollen head bother you. Yeah, and I'm then the, the sparkling garami. Did you think of that one too? No. Nice job, whoever thought of that. Yeah. You get an A for the day. And speaking of Sparkling Grammy, um, Atrian had a question on the Sparkling Grammy. You could watch their video, Sparkling Grammy, some video. And can you put a, can you put one in a 10 gallon? Sure. Yes. And could you put a group in a 10 gallon? Could you put, what would you put? I don't know if I, ugh, these Sparkling Grammys are so, so weird. They're so tiny. They are so but tiny. But they get multiple males, and they start chasing. They do stinkers. chase each other around. Yeah. So you had them in a twelve long, and that twelve long is like three feet long. And even with that, some of the males sometimes be like, "Hey, man, I don't like you." You could do a pair. You could do maybe a male and, and multiple females. You could try that. But yeah, they just get so weird sometimes. Like for a little thing, if I were to do multiple grammys, I don't. I don't know if I'd do it in a ten. I probably wouldn't. But the honey grammy in a twenty for sure. But. If you can find someone who can who can make sure you're getting the right uh, ratio, you can do a male and try to do some females and see how it works. But yeah, sparkling Grammy does fine on his own, and yeah, a one and sure. a five gallon or a ten gallon would be just fine. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes they can be a little shy, but once they get used to their surroundings, it might take a few weeks. They're like, okay, man, this is cool. Jan, oh my gosh, member for thirty months. I wow. haven't seen thirty months. I don't <laughs> think that's Your cool. Thank top. you. That might be. Uh, 75 gallon <coughs> with a Jack Dempsey, a Blood Parrot, Synodonis, and Severum. That's a cool combo. Will one male Firemouth be okay, or do they need to be a pair group? No, they don't. They don't need. To. In fact, if you get a pair, then they're gonna probably want to have a space, and they're gonna start fighting with everybody and try to protect that area. And based on what you've got in there, they lose that fight to the Jack Dempsey. They might eventually win against the Blood Parrot. The Synodonis is too stupid to realize he's in a fight. And the Severum, especially if it's a green Severum, is going to be like, yeah, dude, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to take this space and uh, eat your fry. But one would be fine. Just keep an eye. So I th if it were me using my fish intuition, if there's going to be a problem, it's going to be between the Firemouth and the Jack Dempsey. And only because I've kept those combos before, it wasn't horrible. And it wasn't, I didn't have them in a 75. I had them in a smaller tank. And they would definitely lock lips sometimes. And the Jack Dempsey, as it grew, was like, yeah, we're, I'm winning this thing. A lot of times the fire mouth just kind of shows off and flares its gills. And a lot of times that will kind of intimidate fish. But the Jack Dempsey, full grown Jack Dempsey's, you know, a 10 inch Jack Dempsey is going to usually beat the snot out of a four or five inch fire mouth. Certainly try to have a backup plan, uh, but just do one. Do one and cut down on the chances of them being territorial because they're breeding. Uh, James says that he likes the uh, 16 gallon for a few small grammy, heavy, mm -hmm. heavily yeah, planted. Yeah. Yes, definitely heavily planted. And scapes and uh, uh, black water. Yeah. Oh, very, very nice. Yeah. Heavily yeah. planted changes things a little bit. Yeah. But in a 10 gallon, I would still have it heavily. Or, and again, you don't, when we say heavily planted, if you're not someone who's into live plants, then just get really nice looking artificial plants. And that kind of breaks up a line of sight a little bit. So and the other, th other thing too is if you do wind up with a pair and then the, the male makes his little bubble nest and then there's eggs up there, he's going to probably chase the female away. And if you have multiples, he's really going to chase them away. So he'll be a little rough on them if they get near the bubble nest. Uh, Salient Aquatics uh, wants to know, 
Which tanks do you think were built better? 50s and 80s, or maybe that meant 70s and 80s, or modern ones, not custom tanks? Oh, th there's no doubt in my mind that the older tanks were built better. Hmm. I've got really? an all glass 75 gallon that I got, I told the story probably 50 times, but I got it from my uncle. He bought it in the 80s, gave it to me in the 90s. I've never resealed it. It's It's got the ugly wood trim. It's the one that's holding the albino heckali, and it's still kicking here. It's 2022. That tank is probably 35 years old and has never been resealed. And the glass, and part of it is, of course, the brand, right? All glass is, was at that time a fairly decent brand. And it, it's got, I mean, you just pick that tank up. You look at the glass. It's much thicker than today's glass. You pick it up. It's a heavier tank because the glass is so much larger on all four sides and the bottom. So, um, I, I definitely the older tanks there was thicker glass and I think they just did a better job and even now so here's something I'm gonna make a video about this it's coming out in the next couple weeks because I think I just need to as I'm thinking about it one of the things you should be doing if you are looking at buying a fish tank wherever you go I don't care and if you're buying a kit open that box up you should be taking your finger and gently running it along the sides of the tank. Those panels, those glass panels should be flush. You should not be feeling ridges in the sides. Nothing should be sticking out because a lot of these manufactured tanks, and I don't mean to pick on these, but they're just the most popular, like the Aquion, the top fins, you gotta be careful. And I think that's one of the reasons why people say, oh my gosh, yeah, these, you know, you hear these horror stories about, oh, I went to Petco and PetSmart and I bought these dollar per gallon tanks and they blew a seam and they're leaking water, they're horrible, don't ever buy them. I have only had a problem with one tank in all the tanks we've ever bought. And almost every tank that you see in our fish room probably came from Petco or PetSmart, with some exceptions, like the lifeguard tanks. These are really good. Uh, but almost all of them have come from Petco or PetSmart. Almost all of them are the top fin, aquion, cheap, dirty sort of tanks. But one of the things I do... Dirty. Cheap and dirty, like just down there and, you know, just a, just a tank, a working man's tank. So anyway, every time I go, and there would be times where, I mean, I've had old videos where like, we just bought 20 tanks. Guess what I'm doing? Every single tank, I'm feeling all the edges to make sure that all those glass panes are lined up as well as they can be. And I'm looking at the black rim on the top and the bottom, making sure there's not a gap. The minute you've got a gap, that black piece of plastic, by the way, those black rims on the top and the bottom, that is the majority of the strength that's holding those tanks together. It's not the silicone around there. So you're depending on that black ribbon. So if the glass pane is even a little bit off and now it's not flush, guess what's gonna happen over time? As the water's pushing on all four of those walls and it starts to push that out, you run the risk, the higher risk of busting a seam because the glass is not resting against the, you, you didn't even know this, did you? You didn't know that I thought this through to the extent that I do. Killer, no, killer. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> that is my long-winded answer for your very short question. They were built better back in the day. I don't think there was as many issues. I think salient agrees. Okay. Uh, <laughs> would you like to know what Whoops World Move says? On. What's that? Whoops World says, remember that time I was a primetime primate for a couple of years and then I wasn't anymore? <laughs> yeah, good times. That's true. You probably would have been up there with the record, too. That's <laughs> <laughs> funny. He's all back to, like, rookie status. <laughs> That's okay. Man. That's that's all right. It's the, it's a bummer. We, we know. We all know the truth. Yeah, I think. But Those actually, who know, I think know. Uh, James James Green might be the longest running member. He might have been the first one. Really? I'm pretty sure. Wow. And this was going back, but Jan's got to be right there too because 30 months is a long. I, I don't remember yeah. when we started the memberships, but it's got to be right around that time. Man. So it's a long time. I'm crazy. M and C second floor. All right, he's talking to second floor. Charlie says moving my. Ooh, you're, hold on, Msobo, so it's the Mbuna, uh, to a new 125 gallon is, uh oh is there anything I can put in with them that won't crossbreed? You know, it, it, the Msobo, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the Mbuna, right? I don't have a lot of cross, I don't have, in fact, I don't know if I've ever had Mbuna hybridized. I know a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you know, you put these fish together and they have fry and you're gonna just get a bunch of hybrids. I've been keeping Mbuna for most of my life. I have yet to have them hybridized. Now, that being said, I am not keeping really closely related fish together. 
So if you know you look at my Embuda tank, it's like, oh, you've got Red Zebra and Yellow Labs and ACI and Johani and uh, what else? Slosi and Rusty Cichlids. So they look, they appear very different. So I think that cuts down on the likelihood that they crossbreed because the females are like, mm-mm, you don't look like me. I'm not, I'm not, ha I'm not having it. That's what they say. I hear them. I'm not having it. So I've never had them crossbreed. So th the point is, find Imbuna that really don't look anything like the Imsovo. And I, well, you do have a problem because the males are blue. I think the blue, aren't the females, I've had them before. The females are yellowish. And I think the males are blue, is that it? Or orange and blue. So maybe you don't do Solosite with them, but you could do Red Zebra. You could do, I don't think they'd, I don't know if they would even bother with messing with the yellow labs, probably not. Rusty Cichlids, ACI, I think you'd be okay. They're, they're, they're different enough where you cut down on the likelihood. CEO says, which water conditioner to do you recommend for beginners? Um, we use all Fritz. We're sponsored by Fritz, so I'll say that up front, but we are sponsored by them because I absolutely love their stuff. So the Fritz Complete is really good stuff. Fritz Guard is another one that's really good. You want so I especially for beginners, especially for people who have smaller volume tanks, which I'm meaning like less than hundred gallons, the liquid water conditioners are a lot easier to use. Oh yeah. So like the Fritz Complete, the Fritz Guard, very easy to use. Once you get into very large tanks, like you know that 400 gallon we were talking about earlier, then you go with like the Fritz ACCR, and that's a powder, but it's very concentrated. And so, or like the other one, the Seachem Safe, it's, it takes very little. When you're, I mean, I think like the Seachem Safe is like one teaspoon for 300 gallons, and so you you try to put that stuff in a 20 gallon. Like, All right, I'm gonna basically put in like a half a pinky nails worth, and be like, er, okay, that, and it doesn't seem like it's enough, but liquid for sure. For beginners, Fritz Guard, or the, the, like the Guard or the um, Safe will both work. So, or, or the Fritz Guard and the um, Complete, sorry. I had a brain freeze there. Oh, Terry says, how does the female Embuna know what she looks like? <laughs> she doesn't have to know what she looks like. She just has to know what he looks like. And since she can see him, she's like, mm-hmm, you're what I want. I guess the females will see the other females back. Hmm. I think you're the same. I'm using my women's intuition. They're using their women's intuition. That's what they're doing. Yep. I've talked to them before. James, I'm telling you, man, we're always on the same wavelength. This is so funny. It says, just hit me. Joanna should scape all the tanks behind you. One day is a single scape running through multiple tanks. Funny story. <laughs> funny story. Wait, who said that? James. <laughs> Funny story. That's actually how I initially intended it to be, but um, and it kind of sort of was that way at first. Well, kind of. It kind of had like a try to have like a flow, but I was thinking of an actual full scape that I was going to be cutting driftwood, uh, like a single piece, or you know, especially through some of them. So if you and I'm I'm I in all of these actually, if I get the okay to rescape them or do something, actually, if it were up to me, I would redo this whole backdrop. Just pipe that in. Should okay. we change the background? Hold on. I, I do want to ask a question. This is this is a question. I want your I want your opinion. And if you watch on the replay, leave it in the comments section below. But for right now, we've thought about this and we've we've been discussing this. Hmm. So right now, these are four eight point three lifeguard aquariums. We really like them. So there's no complaints about these tanks. The internal filters run really well. I like the the dimensions of them for the most part, especially like for a cube. They're elevated. They yep, look they're elevated, nice. which I like. The mm -hmm. glass is high quality. Mm -hmm. However, I'm of the opinion, and, and I think you kind of sort of wouldn't mind this, is if we ran 155 gallon. So right now it's four 8.3s. So you're basically what you're getting. Let me want to see me do some math. Basically like 33 gallons. Very Whoa. good. Whoa. 33.2-ish gallons. But that also includes a little filter space behind. Mm-hmm. So maybe we're getting like 30 actual gallons out of that. Where we could run a single 55, still keep it nano, still keep it all unheated. What do you think? It would be taller, so it would be a little bit taller than these. I don't know how tall those are, but maybe from top to bottom, I would imagine they got to be 15, 16 inches where the 55 would be a little bit taller. So what do you think? Should we go with the 55 or should we just leave it as is? I don't know. I'm always torn because this this dresser over here is a is a behemoth. I mean, there is no doubt in my yeah, mind that can hold a, a 55, like without 
any question in my mind, that thing is built way better than any aquarium stand I've ever built from a from a pet store. Yeah. Ooh, Jason, that's I. I like where are you going with that? He said fifty gallon, just a few inches shorter. So the, oh. they, yeah, they have a four foot fifty gallon. Because hmm. uh, I'm not I mean, real fond. The, 30, the thirty three long. I love the thirty three long. It's a problem with the thirty three long. I thought mm. about it because I. You know me. I will take a 33 long in our fish room over a 55 any day because I can triple stack them and they're easier to work with. But the problem is going to be it's going to be even shorter than this because it'll only be 12 inches. You won't be uh, able to see it. 12 inches tall as opposed to even these are. So it like basically come down to like right here. So that's the only reason why I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, same thing with the MNC, same thing with the 40. So the 40 would basically be probably the same as this, but one tank. So I'm thinking if I go 55, we get a few more inches. And I also, my hope is I cannot, I, and I have, oh, guys, and some of you have used guys. Um, I have played with this. This bothers a lot of you. It bothers me. And it's this washed out yeah, bright thing going on there. I, can, I have tried to adjust the light, turn it up, turn it down, deal with the lights that we've got over here and here and here. I've tried adjusting camera settings. I've tried adjusting our software. I cannot fix this and it's very frustrating so i'm wondering if we went up and i didn't have all these floaters here if it would relax all of this back here as well so uh 60 breeder a lot of people are saying 60 breeder the 60 breeder the problem i love the idea i don't think the 60 breeder one now we're getting a little bit out of my comfort zone because now we're getting even heavier but this dresser if we do the 60 breeder, I think it might take up almost, well, no, I probably still have a little bit of room, but not a whole lot front to back. And it, it might be a little bit heavier than I think I would want. But I like the 60 breeder idea. I like those tanks. The other issue with the 60 breeder, though, it's going to be shorter. So I think we're going to be back. The 60 breeder is about the same height as a 40, uh, as a uh, 40 long. So I, I want a little bit taller. I'd like to be able to see like where we see this. I'd like to see more fish swimming around and, and stuff like that. Um, Chris says, dim the lights with black electrical tape. So I can, this has, this is a higher light. These lights are amazing. I can dim this light down, down, down. And all it does is still get this annoying stuff, but then it just basically on camera, then you can't see the tanks at all. Morgan says, do a custom 48 by 12 by 16 would be a 40 gallon. Yeah, that's, that's basically, I think that's the 40 gallon breeder. And we, I wouldn't have to do custom necessarily because there are some pet stores by us that sell the 40, um, the 40, sorry, the 40 longs. So I can get those. Ooh, Cane Club says, how do I cycle a tank the fastest? I like that question. Um, I did a video on that, how to type, how to cycle a tank fast. So if you were to type in, if you're ever trying to find a video, if wondering if we did a video, type in the thing that you want to know about, and then just type in primetime aquatics after it, and it will pop up. So if you type in like how to cycle a tank fast, primetime aquatics, it will come up. But basically the short, short version is you got a brand new tank. There's two ways, add fully cycled media from a, an existing tank to that tank, as long as the tank that you're pulling from doesn't have any disease. It, you know, all the fish are healthy. You trust the source. You can put the cycled filter meter, whether it's sponge or filter floss, right in your new filter. That will help. Just remember that a lot of your beneficial bacteria are not just in the media. They're also all covering, they're covering all the surfaces of your tank. So you're still going to want to stock the tank at first very, 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 very lightly. And so what I mean by that, if I had a 20 gallon, and I was pulling fully cycled media out of another 20. And I put that in my brand new hang on back filter, let's say. That new 20 gallon at first might only see a couple touches. You know, maybe like, oh, I'm gonna get three neons or something, and I'm gonna wait a couple weeks, make sure I got no problems. All right, cool, I'm gonna throw in another five or six or seven. Now, the other thing that you can do, like let's say, well, I don't have any cycled media, or I wanna add more than just a few fish. We have done, at this point, many, many tanks where we've got no cycled media, brand new sponge filter, like let's just say a five gallon. We chuck a beta in there and a snail and Fritz Zyme 7. So Fritz Zyme 7 is, we definitely have that in our fish room all the time. I just did that video on Sunday where we talked about the importance of Fritz Zyme 7 and how we basically got rid of that ammonia spike. Uh, that, was a, that was a really important part. So Fritz Zyme 7, lot, the key is 
live nitrifying bacteria. If whatever you're buying claims to be a cycle starting solution and it does not have live nitrifying bacteria, you're basically buying garbage. That's my opinion. I don't care who makes it. If you are not buying live nitrifying bacteria, you're buying something that isn't going to do much for your cycle and you're still going to get an ammonia spike. So that's the key. But that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. Fish, fish fan 20 gallon long is in the house. What's up? Hey, it's been a little while. Had co well, here, had COVID. Daryl says hi. All five tanks doing good. Well, thanks for being here. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Daryl. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're recuperating. I'll tell you right now, it has been crazy the last four weeks. Most of you know I'm, I'm a biology professor at school. How many students are like, like really like sick, not like, hey man, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be in class today because <laughs> I don't feel good. Uh, I got a stiff neck or something like that. It's like, because they, at this point, people are just doing what they used to do and that is they're just showing up and they're sick. And it's like, well, all right, we're kind of doing that again. But at one point I had, so two weeks ago, I think I had like five or six students that were like legit walking in my office like, I'll just stand back here and I don't want to get you sick. I'm like, dude, I've been sick three times this year. If you're going to give me something new, have at it because I've already gotten as sick as I can be. So it was like, we're in, in one class, there were five students sick uh, two weeks ago. Last week, another three. And then this week I had three more students and I was like, wow, well, pretty much everybody. And it's that way in all my classes, we're getting colds and flus and COVIDs and all kinds of stuff. So I'm glad you're here and well enough to hang out with us. Anybody else here been sick multiple times this year? Because a lot of people I know, it's like, oh, I've been sick this sick time number three for me. Uh, Klaus Aquatics, member for 16 months. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening, guys. Had a near snail crawl out of his tank tonight and go on a suicide mission into the yo oh, yo loach God. tank. Glad I walked in on, on time. It's like, hey, man. Don't there's, do it. There's other nearites in the tank. He's like, hey, guys, watch this. Those things, they've been eyeing me. I think they like me. I'm going to go make a friend. Crawls in their tank. Like, What's up? They're all like, no, get out. You don't know what you're doing. Like, yeah, I do. They just wanted to be my friend. I think the bigger problem that you have is not your nearite. It's the yo-yo loaches being like, hey, buddy, come here, man. No, we're not going to hurt you. It's going to be okay. You just come here and say hello. We, we just want to say hi. We've never met a nearite snail that we haven't eaten. <laughs> That's the conversation that happened in that tank. Sure. It is. Sure. Javon says, so I have a 20 gallon where the black plastic rim is m movable and water can get in get in it. What should I do? So you got a, just a standard 20 black plastic rim is movable. Water can get in it. Um, is it movable to the point where so I wouldn't necessarily freak out about it because if it's all if it's not cracked, right? That's the big thing too. If it's not cracked, and it's like one of those things where it's like, well, you know what? The silicone is not holding the black plastic rim in the way it used to. Keep in mind, as long as it's seated in there properly, if you're worried about, oh, is my tank on a bus? Probably not because the glass is still pushing out on all four ends. Now it's movable a little bit, which means you've got some play in there, so maybe some of the glass isn't. The thing that you have to be careful of right now is. When you fill that tank up, if you fill it too high or fish start splashing around, it's water coming, kind of seeping out of that seal. But it sounds like it's something where you could certainly go in there and reseal it, something I have never done. So I can't give you advice on how that's going to work. You got something? I was <laughs> I was looking up all of James's uh, uh, size tanks um, <laughs> because he refers to it as cm and p like 120p and so i gotta look those up oh yeah okay well did you find any <gasps> new cool tanks. stuff yeah lots oh, of options oh my gosh although the 120p is an 80 man. gallon i think so that's too big but it's a cool tank race says seat comes stability is nitrifying bacteria yes it does uh, that you can use to add fish right away that, again as long as it's got live nitrifying bacteria that is the key you know what's also pretty cool is that we were up at, and this has been a while, but we were at Aquatics Unlimited, and I think we were somewhere else where some fish stores are finally starting to figure it out. And they were selling pre-cycled media. And what they were doing is they were dosing this thing with ammonia, 
and then they had like these big giant bio balls and it was dosing with ammonia and I think they were using some type of live nitrifying bacteria and they basically had this big tank full of fairly large uh, basically like bio balls and they were fully cycled and so they were telling especially new customers hey yeah stock your tank lightly take one of these chuck it in your filter I'm like that's a good idea if I were a pet store a fish store I would never let a customer leave. I wouldn't even sell them fish for a new tank unless they bought live nitrifying bacteria or there was some type of, like what these pet stores are doing, they had basically, okay, here's some pre-cycled biomedia. There's no fish in this thing, so there's no chance of getting disease. Putting it in a bag with water and be like, you have to put this in your tank. I am not selling you fish in a brand new tank unless you either buy that product that has live nitrifying bacteria or this one. If you don't like it, go somewhere else because what you're going to do is you're going to buy your fish, you're going to buy your... 20 fish, you're going to stick it in your 10 gallon, and in three weeks, you're going to come back to me and tell me about how your fish are dead. And I don't need that kind of problem. So you either buy the cycled stuff, the Fritz Time 7 or whatever stability, and your fish, and we're fine. If not, hey, go to the next place and you can return your dead fish to them and have them deal with it. <laughs> so I, I don't know why pet stores don't require that of new customers. It's a good point. I think so. Nice job. Could uh, you imagine going to my pet store? Oh, so you're new. Yeah, I'd like to buy these fish. All right, you're buying that too. No, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. I'm not. Give me you're my out. fish back. Yeah. No you're soup out. for you. <laughs> I'd be that guy. No, no soup for you. No fish for you. Mm -mm. Uh -huh. But but could you imagine like the reviews we'd get on our business website? Like he kicked me out of the store and told me never to come back until I buy the cycled bio media. I don't even know what that is. It's a bag of dirty stuff. Yeah. He wanted me to buy a bag of dirty filter floss. <laughs> That's right. He was going to charge me for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Junction says, my goldfish hates me, sir. What to do? Oh, Hate him back. Right. <laughs> Works for me. Uh, hmm. That's a Christmas movie quote. Uh, so, um, my goldfish hates me. I don't think your goldfish hates you. I think if you were to sit down and have a conversation with your goldfish, it just needs to share some feelings. Maybe it's just got some pent up bad memories as a tiny little fish. Otherwise, it's probably just a little nervous right now. And if you've, if it's a new goldfish, it's probably just a little scared of its brand new surroundings. Goldfish tend to be somewhat oblivious to their surroundings. So if you've got a hiding goldfish, give it a week or two until it realizes you're the one that has the magical stuff for its stomach called food. It will forget the hatred. Trust me. Bill's Gaming says, hey, what do you think about black diamond blasting sand as a substrate? Now, I know we have a lot of people who watch that love black diamond blasting sand. I personally have never used it. I know it's a little bit on the sharp side. So if you have little critters that are towards the bottom, like quarry cats, probably not the best choice. But James, if you're still here, I would be curious what you think about black di diamond blasting sand. Because I vaguely recall, if I recall this correctly, Jen Williams is not a fan of black diamond blasting sand. And I have not yet gotten the chance to ask her why? So I didn't know if you had any, or if anybody else has any thought on black diamond blasting sand. And to be clear, we've got a bag of it sitting in the garage because you were going to try it for like I was. maybe a year ago and it's still sitting in the garage. So yeah, we don't, I've I got a lot of substrates that I've uh, tried. A lot of guys in the fish clubs use it and, and love it. And they keep a lot of cichlids that are going to be kind of, you know, sifting through the sand and stuff. And they don't seem to mind it. Other people are like, yeah, you know what? I think it's scratched up my quarry cats and my loaches. And so they won't use it. Uh, so... Yeah, that's, and we haven't used it. So unfortunately, we don't have a real strong opinion either way because it wouldn't be knowledgeable. Uh, Farallon's here. Hi, Farallon. Well, what's up? And I hear you got Hillstream Lodges. Hillstream Fry. Hill, Hillstream Fry. That's got to be a really cute little thing. I know. Things swimming around all crazy. And I know somebody else, I I think I, I can't get to it anymore, but somebody else got uh, maybe pumpkin shrimp fry. <laughs> you get oh, pumpkin shrimp and then you yeah. get some freebie bonus little fries. Really cool. Oh, they're so cute. Kyle B says, how many root tabs per large sip, uh, uh, crip? One. I just put, it's not so much root tabs per, I guess it kind of would be per plant, but generally speaking, I think if I'm doing root tabs, maybe like in a 10 gallon, I might do three, one on each side, one in the middle. If it was a 20, I might do four or five, 20 longs, maybe six. And I'm just kind of, sp I'm just spitballing here. Uh, I wouldn't take this as a hard and fast rule. If I had a 40 gallon, I might do nine. So I'm just kind of evenly spacing them out. And 
what a lot of people find interesting is when they ask us about root tabs, we put them in when we set up a tank and never add them again. We don't do highlight plants, we don't do CO2, and we don't do you know a lot of the hard to grow plants or dwarf hair grass, but for all this, like crypts, swords, newbies don't even need root tabs because they're uh, the roots are in, basically in the water until they grow really long, but still mostly water column feeders. Jungle Val, a lot of the beginner stuff that you would find at a Petco, PetSmart, low light, medium light, no CO2 sort of things. The, once the fish start producing waste, I generally don't do any heavy gravel vacs around right where the, the base of the plant is. And that has every tank. Here's the example. All these haven't put any root tabs in any of them. I haven't put liquid fertilizer in those things ever no root tabs since we got them started and that's just every tank in our entire fish room yeah but most plants in there aren't planted a lot of that's anubias a good point. there's some crypts in there though true yep true okay so uh all right so brickley bell hi hey, what's up? she says that uh uh let's see she uses the black diamond blasting sand and medium grit in my planted aquascapes and i love it cool. uh but jane all right so james says uh that's one reason it's rough, and I think it's a silicate sand. We generally only use natural sands that are quartz-based. Diatoms love silicates. Love it. That's excellent. A lot of good info. So that would be okay. And Brooklyn Thank knows you. Her stuff too. And, and fact, yeah. if you so it's yeah, if you if you go on the the uh, Rominos tetra species profile, that tank was aquascaped by her and her crew. So. Ooh. They they know they know some things. Melanie says, "Member for two months. First of all, thank you so much. Any advice on treating green fungus on shrimp? I wish I did. I wish I I've never had to treat it, so I don't know. Uh, anybody here who's had shrimp, green fungus on shrimp, had something that worked for you? But I I've never had to treat shrimp disease before, so I would not be a good person to answer because I'd just be like, uh, try this, but I wouldn't know if it actually worked." Whip says, Oinky, have I told you how amazing you are today? Well, that was so oh, sweet. Oh, it's everybody. The kind of love that's flying around here. Yes, everybody say how awesome Oinky is. Oh, Lefty says, I use it in tanks. So back to the black diamond blasting sand. I, I use it in tanks with Corys and yo-yos. And I'm assuming the next sentence would be without any problems. <laughs> Lefty's like, yeah, I use it in tanks with Corys and yo-yos. And yeah, they're a little shredded, but you know, no. So that's good. Thank you for sharing your experience. That's important. Ben's here. What's up, Ben? Ben O'Chart's here, hanging out. Oh, hey, Ben. What's up? What's up, man? <laughs> All right, hold on. I saw something. I mean, it says, can oh. Manzanita wood drop KH? Uh, question mark stand. If no, what wood? Newer setup, testing lower than my others. Uh, what will drop KH sometimes is ammonia. So check, just double check ammonia, especially if it's a new setup. But no, uh, Manzanita typically isn't going to drop KH and the sand definitely should not. The other thing that may play a role in more pH than anything else is if you use some of the aqua soil type stuff, but it could, ammonia will sometimes deplete your KH. Let's see here. And Layton, thank you so much for the super chat. If you get a peak of ammonia or nitrites in an aquarium with fish in it, is there an estimate for how long it, they can live, be alive in it? Any estimate? That's a great question. That's a really good question. It depends on how much. So let, let me give you an example. The video I just did on Sunday, by the way, if you're having that problem, watch the video I did on Sunday because that was the problem I was dealing with and not one, not two, but four tanks. But it was only, it maxed out at about one part per million. I think in the video it was at a half, but huge water changes. Um, just keep in mind, ammonia is immediately, hold on, let me back up. Unionized ammonia, UIA, is immediately toxic to fish. And I, I make that distinction because most ammonia test kits measure total ammonia nitrogen. I did a video on why ammonia kits will sometimes lie to you if you want to see that. They're, the pH and the water hardness is going to play a role in that, as well as salinity. But assuming that your, your test kit is measuring, and the problem is primarily unionized ammonia, the, the bad ammonia, the stuff that can destroy gills and, and really hurt fish. Half a part, one part per million, as soon as you're registering that, you, you need to get that down. You wanna get that down. But it's obviously gonna be a lot less toxic than if you're going two, three, four parts per million. That's usually like, oh wow, yeah, they died in a day or two. The one part per million type stuff, they're not happy about it. But usually if you're doing your water changes and you are adding your beneficial bacteria 
like we did in the video, you can fight that battle and many fish will go many multiple days and, and not be feeling great. But basically, if you're dealing with high ammonia, reduce the feeding because the, the more you feed, the more waste is produced, the more ammonia the fish is going to produce. So we're going to reduce that. And plus, if, if the ammonia is really high, sometimes fish are like, I'm not, I, I can't eat right now. I'm hurting. So they're sick, right? Just like when you're sick, you got a big, heavy cold or flu. It's like, I don't really feel like eating. Some people do. I do, but sometimes you <laughs> don't. Uh, reduce feeding, huge water changes. And that's one of the, the points I made in the video. I brought that tank down. It was like a 90% water change because a lot of what happens is when an ammonia spike occurs, a lot of people are like, all right, I did a 25% water change or a 50% water change and it's really not changing. No, you go really big water changes. And if you've got to do that daily, you have to do it daily, all the while adding live nitrifying bacteria. Like the, if it's an existing ammonia spike, like Fritz Turbo Start or the Fritz, uh, Fritz Lime 7, live nitrifying bacteria is going to help that. But you want to do those three things in conjunction. If you've got fish that don't mind salt, add some salt to the tank. Uh, even if it's like one tablespoon per 10 gallons. Now, if you've got plants and you've got quarry cats and loaches, they're going to be like, even at one tablespoon, 10 gallons, I'll probably be like, all right, that's fine. But, and the other thing to consider too is ammonia is going to be not necessarily more toxic, but it's going to stress fish out differently. So if you've got fish that are naturally really active, that have a high O2 demand that are, so I'm thinking of things like rainbow fish, like we had in one of our tanks, tinfoil barbs, silver dollars, ballast sharks, fish that are constantly on the move they when the ammonia damages their gills that is going to be a lot more detrimental to them than a fish that's just like a garami let's say or a better where it's like yeah this sucks but i can go up to the top and i can gulp air and i can kind of get around some of that so i know it's a little complicated but there you go i got a couple all these right are oh my gosh these are fun Kayleen asks a, uh, this is a really good question. For quarry cats that are best in groups, does it count with different types? Like if you have panda quarries and uh, Delphi? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, no, I think for me, I, w I like to try to keep quarries in at least groups of four, you know, six, eight. The more you got, the better, right? The more quarry cats you have, that is reasonable. I'm not talking about, hey, keep a group of 10 quarry cats in a 10 gallon. But if you've got like a 20 long and you keep a half a dozen, that's cool. But if I got a 55 gallon, hey man, I don't want a half dozen in there. I want like 15 and I want to see the little quarry cat piles and they're just so dang cute. But it doesn't matter if it's pandas, Adolfi, Venezuela, your albinos, groups. So if you think a group is, say for a smaller tank, you have a group of six. So you could do three and three? Oh, you mean will they, will they group together? That's how no. I'm reading it. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but you could well, also... So you to to meet the quota the quote the quota of a group you wouldn't use two different species two I would different prefer, types. I, that's a great yeah that's a great distinction. I would prefer to have at least four to six of one group. Okay. But if you want to do like oh if you had a choice like oh I think I'm gonna do ten quarry cats and you want to do like five Adolphi and five pandas you can do that. Okay. Sometimes they'll hang out. They're certainly not gonna be adversarial to one another. At least they're usually not. And I could have totally been reading that wrong. But okay, yeah. here's another one. Okay. Stacking. This is from Abe Link. <laughs> Love nice. that. Love it. I have a 75-gallon tank with a blood parrot, two electric blue cars, one red shoulder severum, and one heckli. Do you have uh, room for a schooling fish? And if so, any suggestions? This is in a 75. All right, can you say that one more time? So you got the heckli, mm -hmm. blood parrot, severum, two electric blue car. Yeah. You're definitely, I, I think you're, you're probably maxed out on turn like I, and you didn't ask this but i w i wouldn't add any more cichlids to that tank and when they get full grown the severum is going to get big blood parrot's going to get big that heckle is going to be 10 inches potentially the blood parrot's going to look like a freaking softball um severums get very large the electric blue car actually get fairly large and sausage like so ah man I, would i add schooling fish I don't know if I would. Um, and it's not so much that it, it, you're on the right track. I just think for now, let, let's let those fish grow up, get full size, and then see how you feel after they're all full grown. I mean, the tank is fine for, for what you have. I just don't know if I'd want to add anything else until you see like, okay, wow, yeah, that, that severum when it's almost the size of my face, that's, that's a pretty big fish. And 
the blood parrot's all big and bulbous, you know. Second Floor Aquatics, thank you so much for the super chat. Just wanted to say happy anniversary. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Love you guys. Both and appreciate all the great information you guys share in these live streams and through Aww. your videos. Wishing you guys many, many more. Well, thank you. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Oh, uh, so sweet. Let's see. The you can use that to the, get me something. Like a I already did. I, new yeah, fish or something. A, yeah, you I were just faking. Were you? Yeah, yeah I, I, I just want to see how you'd respond. <laughs> Truth be told, I don't care. We we t we she, tend to like alternate she years. Usually forgets. I would say you've forgotten sixty percent of the time. I don't think so. I think it's kind of like fifty fifty. All right, that's fine. 50, Every day 50. is an anniversary. Yeah, that's right. We just yeah, we're like mm -hmm. happy twenty yeah. <laughs> year, five month, and six day and fourth happy hour. Tuesday. Ah, yeah. And he says, Febby's? what's your favorite type oh. of planted substrate? I was thinking of mixing gravel, sand, and eco complete. Oh well. Uh, I, my favorite is black sand, top fin black sand from PetSmart, but I don't think they even carry that anymore. So I'm going to have to oh, switch, whatever. Black but sand. I, I do like your, your basic black sand, uh, but I do deal with mostly like nano tanks. So smaller scale. I, I do like the sand, um, uh, up to 20 gallons, just so you know, I like sand over gravel, but, uh, I use root tabs. So I, I don't typically, a lot of people with planted tanks, the high-end planted tanks will, will use a, like the aqua soil as a kind of like a base layer and then they cap it with sand or gravel. But I generally just do sand and root dabs if planted. Yeah, I'm a plant. So when it comes to substrate, I, I like sand. I think it's more versatile for the most part. You don't see a lot of comments that fish is going to do horrible on sand. You needed gravel. Right, but you will see a lot of fish where it's like, wow, you've got that fish on gravel. It really prefers sand. So, sand is safer, at least in terms of your fish. I have never noticed a difference, at least in the plants that we keep in their growth between gravel and sand. I know if you go out in the World Wide Web, you'll get people, you can't plant plants in gravel. It's just too heavy and the roots get smashed. Or you can't do it in sand because there's just not enough pores and holes. It's like, that's all. It's, the, 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 thing is and you don't really need a specialty substrate as long as you've got the root tabs like I said you put those root tabs in there first and then we never add them again and let the fish waste and everything kind of get in there and, and do its thing now the fish waste sinks into the gravel a lot easier but yeah then you could certainly do the eco complete or the aqua soil and then cap it with sand that's fine too then you have to add the root tabs Cameron says is that a Jason mask or a snowflake on your sweater what? No, this is the, this. All right, so this is Marty Moose. Christmas Marty Moose. No, it's not Marty Moose. It's the yes, it is drink cup that he's drinking the eggnog from. That's Marty Moose. That's why he's using I've it. I've never made that connection. That's crazy. You just blew my mind. Yes, yeah, so it's Christmas vacation, ugly sweater day. That's how I rolled with but it. But you do have a lot of there's little snowflakes. There's like snow everywhere. Yeah, it's probably oh no, wait and this no it is a J. I'm sorry. Yes, that is yeah. because when he comes out and he's gonna chop the trees wearing the Jason the mask. hockey mask. Yep. Oh yeah. Good yeah. Good, good good eye there. Oh well, I guess oh, I've got him up here too. The Jason mask. I get you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's why he wears okay. it. Like, well, I was thinking like chainsaw. that's your head on the top of the sweater, but that's really not a mask that you're wearing. It's I was totally. She was just I got it. like you were calling me some kind of a loser. <laughs> That's my that, job. I don't think yeah, Kevin's <laughs> not that way. My gosh. Uh, no. Uh, let's see here. Brandon says, have you ever kept any bass? No. <laughs> bass get way, 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 way too big for any kind of fish tank we've ever had. I mean, we see those bass at like Bass Pro Shops and those big tanks. I mean, those bad boys are huge and they get massive. So I don't have the tank space for something so crazy large. Hold on. Pete says, I've uh, one Bolivian ram, 10 cardinal tetras, 10 pork chop resboras, and five clown plecos, and a 29 fine. Yeah, that, that's, that'll, be, that'll work. So one Bolivian ram, that's your showcase centerpiece. Love it. 10 cardinal tetras zipping around with your 10 pork chop resboras. Cool. Five clown plecos. They're going to kind of do their own thing, come out at night, clean up. Love it. Do it, man. It'll be cool. Whips World says uh, Cheryl was asking, hey Cheryl, if there's a Python like system out there that doesn't need to hook up to a regular sink. I couldn't think of anything. Python like system. So 
Um, well, I mean, no, because you got the Python, you've got the, we, we use the Aquion, I think it's the Aquion one, it's, it's worked fine, or at least we used to. And then I actually built my own, I went to Home Depot and basically took the broken top fin or Aquion one that you get from PetSmart, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to Home Depot, I'm going to get some PVC with some tourney guys, I should probably do a video on that again, it's been a long time. I showed it in like how we do water changes a long time ago, but I pieced one together and I just leave it connected all the time, because then you turn the sink on, it just flows out. And then you turn the lever thing and it just goes out the side. So, But is there something that you could uh, permanently attach to your sink? That's what I like, did. No, I mean like in a kitchen or something. Oh, I'm thinking don't, you don't, well, that, you could do you don't have a fish room, Cheryl. It just Cheryl. screws in. But then you would probably want some kind of a quick release for the giant 50-foot long hose that's sticking off of ours. Yeah. There's that. So no, huh? I, hmm. Lame. Yeah, I know. Adrian says, is 12 black neon tetras, two honey grammies and five CPDs. Okay, and a 17 gallon. Uh, 17, yeah, I think so. Because 17 is probably gonna be the same length as your 20 gallon anyway. So 12 black neons, that's cool. Two honey grammies will get along fine. Five C uh, CPDs are tiny. Yeah, that'll work. Oh, Cheryl has a sink uh, sprayer. The, I'll pull out sink sprayer. So that wouldn't yeah that's not going to attach so well will it just get yourself a really long hose for the sink sprayer and be like i'm just gonna run over there and spray it in no no holy cow look at the time oh this has wow been the fastest live stream we've had in oh, a my really long time uh yeah we're gonna wrap it up take one or two more questions and then we're gonna let everybody go night night because holy cow morgan says the new the new top fin black sand needs to be rinsed. Really? It turned my water as black as my heart Get does it. when somebody <sighs> tells me they don't like animals. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. So wow. yeah, that's a good piece of information to know. That is good to know. Yeah. Now, all right, here's, the, here, here's my, and I don't know. Did you have, when you set up your filter, was there a carbon thing in there? that wasn't rinsed because that I've had happen where you get like the carbon uh, little you know package that comes with your new hang on back filter or whatever you plop that bad boy in there it starts up I mean you, I guess you probably would have seen that going all over the place when you started up but never mind it's probably a dumb question I'll forget I asked it You're probably like yeah I know the difference between the two man all right hold on I saw something uh, Mel says one female Veta, six quarries ten odos and five pandagara and a 29 for sure. Yep. You roll with that. I like it. Probably got room for other things to let everything kind of settle in and see how they're all getting along. Oh my gosh, the thing just kind of skipped all over the place. All right, everybody. I think we are going to call it a night because it's getting late and we we're way past the time. But you, man, you guys, you brung it today with those sweet questions. So same thing, next week we'll be here, same time, same place. I am fairly certain we are going to have a giveaway next week, do you think? Sweet. We didn't have one this week, so that was lame. So next week we're going to do a giveaway, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you then. Thank And bring the great questions. This was good. Loved it. So thank you so much. Thank you to the moderators, Oink and Whip and, and Dave and everybody else who was Thanks, here and all guys. the super chats and all that stuff and new members. Appreciate it. We will see you all next week. Have a, have a good week. Bye. Bye, everybody.